I'm sitting here with Dr. Will Jackson, who uh, has done a lot of work on anti-fracking protests, but particularly we're going to talk today about the fracking site in Barton Moss in Greater Manchester. Um, but before we get on to that, could you explain to me what exactly fracking is? And I ask because when I read it, first of all, I could not believe that anyone in their right mind would think this was a good idea in any way. <laughs> so okay. could you explain what it okay. is? So fracking, in a, in a basic sense, is a method of extracting natural gas from the ground. It's a, it's a method of extracting gas which is very deep in the ground and it involves pumping water chemicals and usually sand into the rock at high pressure to fracture the rock and release the gas. Right? Now at one level that process, that technology has been around for a very long time, sort of in the post-war period. What's happened recently is that hydraulic fracturing, which is what fracking's Sunday name, is uh, has been fused with horizontal drilling techniques that have enabled the access of previously uh, inaccessible or unprofitable reserves of gas. So being able to drill down and drill horizontally at great lengths has enabled companies, um, or the, the, the industry, to access shale reserves um, in areas that were seen previously to be inaccessible. So what we're talking about here is the access of unconventional fossil fuels. And in the last 25 years in the US, this, this, this technology has enabled a fracking boom and an expansion of an industry at a kind of a phenomenal rate. Um, so something like in the first four years of this decade, there were around 30,000 wells drilled in the US. So the, the, the expansion of the industry and the, the profits that have been produced there have led to people on this side of the Atlantic to get quite excited about, about fracking. And shale reserves have been identified across Europe, and particularly in the UK, including part of the country that we're sitting in now. Mm -hmm. There are significant reserves of shale gas in the north of England, but also elsewhere in the UK. And since 2007, UK governments have encouraged, so we're going from New Labour through coalition and into the current, the current government, have encouraged exploratory drilling. So everything up until recently has been exploring the potential of fracking, the potential of extracting the reserves we know are there, but how viable is it technologically and economically to get that gas? And that's not environmental. <laughs> ah, so the environmental considerations are um, heaped on top of that, that what we have seen in the US are well-documented environmental impacts, and that's why fracking, as it's existed in the US, elsewhere in the world, and currently in the UK, has been a controversial process from the outset. It's controversial in terms of the documented harms to the environment, so we're talking here in terms of air, land and water pollution, but it's also controversial from a broader point in relation to climate change, that you know, there is widespread acceptance that we cannot utilise all reserves of conventional fossil fuels if we want to maintain our targets for, inverted commas, safe Rate rising global temperatures. Mm -hmm. What we're talking about in fracking and other technologies, tar sands in Alberta, for example, is the opening up of unconventional reserves of fossil fuels, which heap on top of yeah. what we already cannot use. So, fracking has a set of concerns at a, a local level, but also a set of concerns at a much broader level, and that's why, since fracking has um, been floated as an idea in the UK, it's been, it's been something which has uh, incited significant opposition at local level and at, and at a national level. Now, we talked, I mentioned previously that fracking has been exploratory, so it's, it's previously been about exploring what's, what's there and what we can access. Where it was attempted in the first instance in 2010 in Priest Hall in Lancashire, the first attempt to actually frack a well, that resulted in two minor earthquakes. So we have a reasonable period of time now where fracking has been explored uh, in the UK and it has become increasingly a, a controversial thing which divides public opinion. Mm. And we've seen in recent years public support for fracking as people become more aware of it, support for it goes down. But that isn't reflected in current government policy, yeah. which is, in David Cameron's words, you know, the government is going all out for shale. 
and that's right. continued under Theresa May. It really doesn't make any sense because what I read is that they actually pump chemicals into the ground um, and this sort of like really horrible, nasty, synthetic, poisonous stuff and this is what cracks like the surface and then the gas is released and then they, the companies will just leave that poison shit in the, in the, in the earth and that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you if you read the information provided by the fracking industry, the chemicals used in the process, which are which cannot be released for uh, under trade secrets, so it's not we can't so they're not we're never told exactly what the mix of those chemicals are for um, basically these these are trade secrets and they're like copyright want, or something. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, the, the industry wouldn't want to give away its recipes, much like McDonald's won't won't want to tell you exactly yeah, how yeah. it makes those milkshakes. <laughs> it's the same kind of process, but they describe them as chemicals similar to those you would find in in household detergent. When you start to look at alternative sources of information, and this is coming from from U.S. Senate committees, there are you know an almost endless number of potential carcinogens and, and things which you wouldn't want necessarily to pump into um, the ground at such depths that leads to the potential, and there is documented evidence that this is realised, to pollute water supplies, you know, never mind polluting the soil and, and the air that comes out of the flaring of methane. So the environmental harms are really what drives the, the opposition to fracking. Their opposition for other reasons, but predominantly the way in which community oppositions have evolved in the UK and around the world to this process, it focuses on the environmental impact and what we see is fracking has become um, really a focal point for the environmental movement in, in this country as it has um, you know, really around the world as we mm. see this, this kind of dash for shale gas evolve yeah. um, almost, you know, in, in every continent now, we see this as, a, as seen to be a, a viable um, technology and it's presented you know, by government and the industry as um, a bridge technology to a greener future. You know the idea that this will help us bridge the gap before we arrive at the point at which we can um, rely on renewable sources. But also that this, in the way in which it's defined in the UK, and this was this was um, reiterated by Theresa May in Parliament this week, mm -hmm. that this provides us with a safe supply of gas. And when they talk about safe, they're talking about the kind of geopolitics that underpins current gas supplies and relationships with Russia, etc. So it's presented as something which makes the UK sustainable or self-sustainable in terms of energy supply. And those concerns at a kind of political and economic level um, are seen to kind of overwhelm environmental concerns. Mm. And, and somewhat ironically, the way that the Conservative Party have justified fracking is in um, through the defence of regulation, it's ironic because this is, you know, these are the, the party against red tape, mm -hmm. but when it comes to justifying fracking, we're told that this will be effectively regulated. So the problems which have been documented in the US won't occur here because we have a, you know, effective regulatory environment. Right, and yet you see, like, lakes in Australia, people are setting them on fire. You said we had two minor earthquakes. I've seen footage of people's taps running green, um, the water's turned green as a result of the fracking that's taking place nearby. Um, are these all similar problems to that which took place in the US and is now being transported over here? Yeah, I mean, the, the argument in the US context is that the industry evolved faster than the regulatory framework could. So the industry was given basically the green light to go wild, and essentially did expand at this kind of exponential rate, and the regulatory framework had to catch up. Now, you could argue whether the regulatory framework was catching up or whether in that context the, the, the idea of regulation has been inherently a bad thing for business mm. affects how the, the, how, how the industry was regulated and still is regulated in the States. But the argument is the same over here. We, we're told that the regulatory environment will be in place to, to prevent environmental degradation but we see already there are um, concerns raised about existing environmental impacts never mind the future potential for an industry that to become economically viable will have to expand at a kind of phenomenal rate across the UK and what we're talking about is a few select wells which have been drilled at exploratory level at the moment but for the industry to become viable we're talking about hundreds if not thousands of wells across the UK. Now I say UK, but actually 
Um, in recent weeks, the Scottish Government has banned fracking. So when we talk about where yeah. this industry is going to roll out, we're focusing really um, on England mm. at the moment. So obviously there's been a lot of opposition to this, particularly uh, in Barton Moss. What exactly was proposed at Barton Moss and what was the community response to it? Okay, so in 2010, the local authority in, in Salford, in Greater Manchester, took the decision to provide a license for a um, company to explore the potential to extract coal bed methane to a similar process and as part of that to explore the possibility for fracking for shale gas as well. It was in the November of 2013 that it became apparent to local community who were warned beforehand that the company iGas, who are a, a company that specialises in onshore oil and gas extraction, were moving into uh, Barton Moss to begin this process of exploratory drilling for coal bed methane and, mm. and potential shale gas. Um, Barton Moss is a, is a an area of, of kind of local environmental importance. It's a green, a green belt area in on the outskirts of Salford, which is a you know industrial part of Manchester or a part of Manchester with industrial history. But Barton Moss is an area of green belt land on the outskirts of the city. There had been before I talk a little bit more about that in the summer of two thousand and thirteen the first um, attempt at exploratory drilling in Balcombe in Sussex, which raise the profile of fracking no end because of the nature of the protests and the involvement of, of high profile campaigners including Caroline Lucas who was then the leader of the Green Party. So when it came to Salford there was some understanding at a local level about what this was but relatively speaking very few people at the time really had an idea of what fracking was. Mid-November 2013 when the company appeared to be beginning its, its preparations for exploratory drilling a group of local residents were joined by more established environmental campaigners who established a, a community protection camp at the site. So to give a little bit of the local geography, the actual drill site was on this green belt land which was about a kilometre down a small single track lane off a main and arterial route into, um, into the centre of Manchester, mm -hmm. the centre of Salford. Um, and the edges of this single lane were grass verges and it was along those grass verges that the local residents and environmental campaigners set up a, a permanent camp, uh, or what was going to be a permanent camp. And they basically camped by the side of this road from mid-November through to the end of April when the exploratory drilling finished. And the idea from, from their perspective was to mount a, or have a permanent presence at the site to demonstrate community opposition and to mount a campaign against fracking, which would raise awareness in the local community that this was happening, mm. to raise awareness about the apparently inherent environmental risks, including the risks to human health that people were unaware of because there were residential housing within a very short, um, short distance from the site, and ultimately to seek to dis delay and disrupt this operation as part of a campaign to demonstrate local and for many people a much broader opposition to this this process. The subject of the report is the policing of that protest. So what were some of your key findings in what way was it policed um, and again how did the community respond to that? Okay so there's a there's a, there's a longer answer to that in a, in a longer report but to, yeah. to get a sense of what is going on the reason I describe the local geography is that when the community protection camp was in place at Barton Moss the predominant emphasis of their protest was to slow walk in front of the daily deliveries of trucks into and out of the site. So we talked about that, that single lane road which runs for about 800 metres from the arterial route from a main dual carriageway to the site. And the focus of the campaign, both of the people camping at the site and the people who visited daily, was to slow walk in front of the trucks down the, down the lane to where they were delivered and then at the end of the day to walk slowly in front of them again. Very shortly after this protest camp was established, Greater Manchester Police formally launched uh, a policing operation which was codenamed Operation Geraldton, mm -hmm. which was focused on the management of these protests at Barton Moss. So the way that the protest played out from very early on, 
was that the trucks would arrive at the beginning of the day, there would be a line of police officers in front of the trucks and a line of protesters in front of the police and the protesters would walk as slowly as they could to delay and disrupt this operation to demonstrate a symbolic opposition to fracking in the, in the, in the local community um, and the police's role was to get the protesters to walk as quickly as possible down the road. Now, some days, and this is partly what we explore in the port report, but also kind of questions that still remain, some days the protesters could take up to two and a half hours to walk 800 metres. So this was, this was part of a campaign of non-violent direct action, mm -hmm. which sought to delay and disrupt in, through forms of peaceful protests, you know, well-established protest techniques of direct action and, you know, kind of well utilised in the environmental movement. The police's role was to get them to move as fast as possible and some days that time could be as little as 12 minutes. So you have over the course of this um, five month police operation, five month protest, a running battle between protesters and police about how these slow walks would play out on a daily basis. And these took place twice a day, four days a week for five months. So we're talking about a significant body of, of kind of protest and a um, quite a serious police operation that cost in, in, in excess of £2 million. Now what we look at in the report um, was the way in which the protest was policed and we explore the interactions between the police and the protesters. Now we did this as a set of, um, of academic researchers with different starting points but our interest was in the way in which people involved in direct action protest were policed because we suggested that in the, the media discussions about fracking and about protest policing more generally in the UK, um, there are a set of well-represented voices, but people involved in direct action protests are largely ignored both by the media and by academic researchers. So our concern was, what are the experiences of people who are involved in, in non-violent direct action? So our report involved um, many visits to the sites as a team of three researchers, myself, Helen Monk from Liverpool, John Moores and Joanna Gilmore is at the School of Law at the University of York, to visit the site and to conduct interviews with protesters to explore from their perspective how the protest was being policed. We also conducted a freedom of information requests to try and get out as much information as we possibly could about how the protest was being managed in the relationships between the fracking industry, the police and the local authority. Now, part of what we detail in the report is how very difficult it is, at that time we did the research and this continues in our ongoing work, to get clear information about the fracking industry and its relationships to the state at both a local and a national level, I mean in terms of local authorities but also in terms of local police forces. They made it difficult? Yeah, I mean we, we had uh, um, many requests for information refused, we took a case out with the Information Commissioner. Um, because there was a reluctance on the part of Greater Manchester Police and later from the Crown Prosecution Service to provide us with accurate information on the way in which the protest was being policed and subsequently the criminal justice response to those people who were arrested at the protest. And the, the report sits in two halves where we talk about the experiences of protesters on the ground and then we talk about the criminal justice responses. Before, we get, before I get to that though, one of the things that we did uncover or through work with the uh, local solicitors firms and um, really important work done by the Network for Police Monitoring who are a coalition of, of activists, lawyers and academics who sought to try and get as much information into the public domain to understand what was happening at Barton Moss but to situate this in the broader kind of evolution of policing practices in the UK. One of the things that we did explore was the production of a memorandum of understanding which was produced at Barton Moss prior to the outset of the police operation, prior to the protest. And this was also produced at, at Balcom. But the Memorandum of Understanding detailed an agreement drawn between the police, the fracking company and other strategic partners. And this was about how they could contribute as a collective to the effective delivery of the police operation. So this involved basically everybody under the sun in Greater Manchester in terms of important institutions from the highways agency through the emergency services, I'd say the landowners, the company, the police. The people who weren't involved in any deliberation or discussion prior to this was any, any local campaigns mm -hmm. or protesters, yeah. which, which might not come to a great surprise to you, but it's important because the way the police operation was explained by the police was that they were caught in the middle. Mm 
and this is verbatim quote from the chief consul at the time, they were stuck in the middle having to balance equally valid rights claims, that you have the protesters exercising their rights under the Human Rights Act to protest in terms of rights to assembly, rights to expression, but then you also have the fracking company seeking to exercise their right, which they have you know, a, a license that's been granted for exploratory drilling. And the police presented themselves there and continue to present themselves in fracking operations taking place in other parts of the country as kind of neutral arbiters stuck in the court in the middle. But when we look at the memorandum of understanding signed before the police operation and we look at the way the police operations evolved here and replicated elsewhere, this idea of the police as neutral arbiters doesn't really stand up to scrutiny. We see uh, what appears to be the police um, seeking to facilitate the development of an industry, to facilitate exploratory drilling. And what is possible for protesters in terms of the way in which they're able to protest seems to be um, increasingly restricted. So we see this evolve at, at, at Balkan prior to Barton Moss. Barton Moss is a really important case study in the way in which the policing of protests generally, but specifically the policing of anti-fracking protests is evolving in the UK. And we see the kind of implications of that at sites in Lancashire at the moment and in, in East Yorkshire. So the report details the experiences of the protesters, which looks at the way in which um, they experienced a disproportionate and violent police response, which used overwhelmingly public order officers, so relied upon, um, in Greater Manchester Police's case, a tactical aid unit, which are the riot cops, basically, who okay. come out. So we're talking about the numbers of police officers in relation to protesters being massively disproportionate, and the nature of the policing in terms of the physicality and the violence of the protest policing in relation to protesters simply didn't fit, and this is a view of many observers, academics, journalists, um, legal observers, that it simply was um, out of step with the nature of the protests. You know, the significant number of the people involved were first-time protesters, these are people from the local area who've done no more than vote or elect their MP. Mm. But they were policed as though they were part of a kind of homogenous group of professional agitators, and this is the way in which the protest was represented by the police as being driven by um, anti-police agitators was the phrase they used. What were some of the particular complaints that the protesters had about the way the, the fracking site was policed? The, the complaints of protesters, and when I mean complaints, I mean talking literally in terms of complaints that were sent to Great Manchester Police Professional Standards and, and to the IPCC, but more generally the, the concerns of protesters that were raised in their discussions with us related to the, the violent nature of a disproportionate police response. It related to the targeting or apparent targeting of specific people involved in protests who were singled out for arrest. So people who were seen to be you know, of strategic importance to a protest group appeared from the protesters' perspective to be singled out for arrest. The, the use of arrest and the use of bail powers were both two central concerns of, of the protesters, that they appeared to be used not in a direct response to criminal behaviour, but in an attempt to, from the police's point of view, disrupt the, the protest and limit its effectiveness in, in its... In its um, engagement with this um, the industry basically so they were about the physicality about the violence and about the the abuse of police powers that we document in the report the other key claim which came came out from the beginnings of our interviews at bottom was the way in which women were policed at the site and there was the perception from many of the people involved both women and men that women were policed in specific ways and there was the um the perception from many of the women involved that there was the threat and for some the reality of um, sexual violence that informed the policing of women. Because what we're talking about here in terms of the slow walks is the very close physical proximity mm. of police officers and protesters. And this was the way the protest played out on a daily basis was about a, a physical um, battle essentially to walk as slowly as possible and for police to make people move as fast as possible. And what was reported to us and is being reflected at other sites, um, and I should say for the benefit of the camera, this is 
absolutely refuted by Greater Manchester Police, was that male police officers used the threat of sexual violence and the reality of, of kind of sexual undertone to the way in which they spoke to and physically interacted with protesters, the way in which they were physically manhandled for many of the women protesters on the front line. There were um, yeah, elements of, of sexual violence or harassment to that. Mm. Now, this is, like I say, uh, rejected by Great Manchester Police and was refuted by the UK government in their response to a report by the UN Special Rapporteur on Rights to Protest from his recent visit to the UK. And their response is that Greater Manchester Police refutes the allegations of the use of sexual violence by police officers, and their evidence for this is that nobody has come forward to report this. Now, we do this interview in the week of concerns about Harvey Weinstein and, and a kind of explosion of discussions about sexual abuse, and the idea being that nobody said anything is evidence that this didn't happen, mm. I think simply doesn't wash, and then there is a need for kind of a, we, we call in the report for a public inquiry into what happened at Bob Moss, and I would make the same call in relation to what's going on at Preston New Road in Lancashire at the moment, that there is something there is something amiss here in the way in which communities are engaging with this industry and being responded to by police. And we need, I think, in the UK to think a lot more seriously about what this says about environmental policy, what this says about democracy and the way in which communities can engage with decisions taken by government. So I've kind of gone beyond the specifics there and into more general concerns, but I think we do need to make those connections between the way in which protesters are being policed and their ability to exercise a right to protest. And this raises concerns, as we do in our wider work here, of how police define what is and isn't acceptable for protesters to do. And really what we're talking here is that forms of political expression which are deemed to be acceptable in the contemporary United Kingdom and those which are seen to be beyond the pale. Mm. And that battle between police and protesters seems to revolve around um, very different conceptions of what peaceful protest is. So at the one hand, the, the anti-fracking movement, as it's played out in various sites, but particularly at Bottom Moss, made a, a universal commitment at the outset to non-violent direct action. This was going to be disruptive, this was going to seek to de delay, but it was going to be commi committed in terms of principles of the environmental movement to peaceful protest. The police have an obligation, and this is a, a kind of formal obligation they recognise since changes to policy in 2009, to facilitate peaceful protest. Right? So we've got, at one level, a commitment to peaceful protest and the, the, the effective facilitation of peaceful protest on both sides. What plays out at Barton Moss suggests is there is a fundamental disconnect in terms of how peaceful protest is defined. Ultimately, when protesters talk about peaceful protest, they mean it doesn't involve any violence or threat to the person. When police talk about peaceful protest, what it appears, both in terms of policy and practice, they mean protest which is non-disruptive. Right, yes. What they mean is protest which is restricted to a symbolic register of opposition. They mean you can wave a banner and you can chant slogans, but anything that goes beyond that into a, a more fundamental opposition that seeks to challenge the status quo and put that in place through direct action is illegitimate mm. and is represented as though it were violent even though there is no use of violence towards mm. personal property and that's you see the same thing with strikes as well it feeds into the media because whenever it comes out uh, there's a strike going on the media call it like a disruption a day of disruption is taking place um so yeah it's it's almost as if the two things are like in collusion with each other the state kind of locks arms and puts out this kind of uh this kind of narrative really is that what you found? In yeah, I mean, the way in which protesters are represented, and we, we detail in the report, you know, we're talking here about the kind of representation through imagery that was produced by the police, that the protesters are inherently dangerous, and protest by extension that takes this form is dangerous and illegitimate. So protesters are represented as though, the first important dynamic to this in terms of police representation at Barton Moss and subsequently other protests is that Protesters have a degree of legitimacy if they live in the local area. Anyone from outside of the local area is seen to be disconnected from the local campaign and have no legitimacy at the site. So the police involved, uh, the silver commander involved at the Operation Geraldton at Barton Moss, continuously drew lines between the local community and professional protesters from outside of the area. Now, this is fascinating given the... Um, wide range and impacts of fracking as an issue that goes well beyond any individual postcode, but it was central to the police narrative and has been central again 
when we see this at Preston New Road, that those people who live there have a degree of legitimacy and should are recognised as legitimate protesters. Anyone from outside is constructed through this narrative of protect professional protesters. And uh, you're right, we see this in terms of anti-austerity, anti-fascist protests, student protests, mm. and beyond. The idea being then that there is a distinction between the local and the, the non-local, but there is a representation of certain sections of the environmental movement or, or wider kind of social justice movements as being um, professional protesters who will basically protest about anything. There is a kind of lack of commitment or a lack of fidelity to this cause and they can be dismissed then as, as illegitimate protesters. And once they're constructed in those terms as both illegitimate and dangerous, that in turn justifies the type of policing response that we've seen at anti-fracking sites and we've also seen reflected at other protests. In, in the sort of last 10 years. Mm. It's interesting from our point of view in terms of academic research that in this, in this period, we've seen changes to police policy which have um, aligned public order policing with obligations under the Human Rights Act and have explicitly sought to reaffirm a police commitment to the facilitation of protests. You know, we know that the rights to protest enshrined under the European Convention are, have the potential to be curtailed but the European Convention makes clear that the, the balance between rights and protest situations should, wherever possible, fall with those seeking to exercise their right to protest. We have that written into police policy, but actually what's playing out on the ground here is something quite different. We see, in terms of, of policies, that police policy in relation to public order policing has developed specifically in relation to anti fracking protests. So this really is the kind of front line of public order policing, in, in, certainly in England and Wales. And we see in this policy the police themselves, senior police officers from the National Police Chief Council and the College of Policing, have sought to explicitly redefine what is and isn't acceptable protest and to seek to limit the parameters within which acceptable protests can take place. And, and what we are seeing at Bart Moss and in a, in a broader um, context is the criminalisation of the forms of direct action protest which have been central to social justice movements for generations. Mm -hmm. You think of the, the movements which are retrospectively kind of accepted into to British history, around the suffragettes and civil rights yeah. and gay rights, all of those would have fallen foul of current definitions of what is and isn't acceptable. So anti-fracking protesters, the environmental movement more generally, is presented as though it is you know, a kind of enemy within. You know, a threat to security and safety, a threat to the economy, a threat to the well-being of the nation. A threat to the peace. Yeah, a yeah. threat to the peace, absolutely. You know, so when we see protesters represented as violent, what our research is trying to explore and working with colleagues, and I say journalists and other organisations, is that this representation of violent protest is about a, an ideological position rather than tactics actually employed on the ground. What's been the role of the media? Was there any media coverage of particularly the Barton Moss and what's been the, the portrayal of like fracking protesters in general in the media? Um, I mean, as a, as, a, as a kind of broad sweeping statement, it suggests that the, the mainstream media coverage has largely um, reiterated the police narrative. So we have in, in, in individual protest situations, including Barton Moss, kind of starkly opposed competing narratives that seek to define the problem of fracking and also the position of the protest and by extension of police in, in obviously quite distinct ways. Mm. Largely speaking, the mainstream media coverage has reproduced the police lie. Not in all cases, but predominantly that's that's been the, the message from in my understanding. And has your report, sorry, been a, 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 a an attempt at countering that narrative? Yeah, I mean the report was or the 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 way of channeling what initially began as, a, as, a, as an academic piece of research into a public report before it became a series of academic publications was that there was a, a need, we thought, to contribute to the debate. The debate, as I said earlier, seemed to exclude certain voices. You know, there were certain voices that were well represented and there are, you see this in relation to a whole range of issues, that there are kind of acceptable faces of campaigns and protests. Um, and others who are marginalised and, and ignored. The aim of the public report was to, to provide a kind of counter-narrative, was to contribute an alternative perspective, and it presented a view from below. That was the aim of the report, whereas 
the majority of media coverage has presented you know, a view from above and, and has reiterated um, the police narrative. Interestingly, Barton Moss is you know, a couple of miles as, as, as the crow flies from the BBC North West headquarters at Media City and ITV. So it wasn't as though this was you know, geographically isolated and they weren't able to cover it, but there's just a limited interest in, in what was going on here. Mm. Um, what has been crucial in relation to Barton Moss and subsequent protests is the role of independent media the role of community media organisations and the way in which protesters themselves have utilised social media. So the way in which I think public opinion is being shifted has not been driven through mainstream media coverage, but has been in the way in which the campaign, you know, the, the environmental movement more generally, has utilised social media and been supported by independent media. So in the Barton Moss case, as we, we reiterate in the report, there was a, a local community magazine called Sol the Salford Star who covered this relentlessly, you know, in the way that a media organisation should cover a, an issue of um, local and national importance. And it was only through their kind of relentless coverage that the perspectives of the protesters were seen by the, the wider community. And we see that kind of reflected in um, other, other fracking sites, but largely speaking, there's a kind of reluctance to cover this. Now, we don't say in the report, this is not an analysis of media representations. We make the point that, that independent media was, was central to exploring alternative perspectives. But we have a government which is fundamentally wedded to the idea of fracking. It is centrally placed within energy policy and it's at the core of this government strategy on energy security. Opposition to fracking has been presented by government as irrational. Now, this is David Cameron's words verbatim. His point is that there is a section of the anti-fracking movement which has an irrational opposition to this process, although they don't, as though they don't recognise the problems. And that idea of, of the anti-fracking movement being a kind of fringe group of lunatics <laughs> is in the same way that you know anti-fascist movements or anti-austerity movements are readily dismissed as being a very small group of people who don't reflect public opinion. Mm. In relation to, I mean, I dispute that in relation to anti-austerity and anti-fascism, but certainly in relation to anti-fracking, there is a, a growing shift in public opinion that those people who are familiar with fracking overwhelmingly reject it. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to a question of would you like this to happen in your backyard, the vast majority of people unsurprisingly say no. So the fact that this isn't being given a, a kind of fair airing, what we constantly see through a kind of BBC approach to media balance is that we present local communities and then the industry as though they have you know, kind of equally valid opinions on the perspective um, and it's very difficult to find space for critical perspectives on fracking from a, in terms of our, our concerns, a socio-legal perspective but also I would you know, say increasingly from a um, science and engineering perspective mm. but you know that there will be other academics better place to talk about. Even from a technological side of things this doesn't really make much sense but also the more that they push this fracking into various different communities, it seems like they're creating new protesters. It seems like they're going to bring about people who, through engaging with fracking initially, then become perhaps more politically conscious. So yeah. you mentioned that not a lot of these people are like hardcore protesters. A lot of them are just people who are just, you know, first timers who know what this thing is and don't want it to happen, then go out there and then the violence of the police is re revealed to them. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the, the first point, I think that policing has two effects. It undoubtedly, in the Barton Moss case, had the effect of turning people off the protest, you know, and it had an effect both in terms of the, the centre of the protest itself, in terms of the way in which people who camped and regularly visited the protest engaged with daily marches, and some people would tell you that, you know, this had a fundamental effect on, on their willingness to engage in direct action because it was represented and responded to as though it were illegitimate, illegal and, and dangerous. It had an effect on people on the peripheries, and here peripheries geographically and ideologically, that the people who were kind of interested in fracking, the policing, the, the physical nature of the policing and the, the narrative put out by, by the police themselves, again reiterated that these people and their movement and their campaign was um, wrong and illegitimate. So you've got that effect on the centre and the periphery. But the, the broader attempt to shift public opinion um, from a, a government perspective, things in, in our experience of interviewing protesters at fracking sites around the country failed. You know, like this response to the police undoubtedly put some people off, but it had a hardening effect on others. You know, I, I, I refuse to use some of the kind of contemporary language that the government used to describe 
people with, with strong political views, but you know, this had an effect of politicizing people. I go that mm. far that people were people were politicized in a way that they wouldn't have been if they hadn't been policed in this way. It, it gave people um, a, a very different perspective on the relationship between police and communities and between state and capital, if you want to put it in those in those terms. Mm. And for many people that was a profoundly traumatic experience to have their view of the police, and I would say to some their view of the world, transformed radically by the way in which their peaceful opposition to something which is happening in their local area um, imposed upon them from up on high. That's the case at Barton Mott at Preston New Road in Lancashire. This is a community who you know, followed all the right prescriptions of how political expression should take place. They lobbied their local elected representatives who took a democratic decision at a planning committee stage Cracking was banned. That was then overturned at the stroke of a pen by the community secretary. So what people in that situation, and I think this was also already the case at Bart Moss are saying, is that their engagement in this type of protest is as a last resort. They've done everything else that they're told to do. Yeah. You know, we're told in this country, don't take to the streets. That's what lunatics do. You know, Don't take to the streets in the way the French have this kind of tradition of taking to the streets. We have parliamentary democracy that functions at a local level and you can follow those kind of channels to, to get what you want. Well, in this sense, we've been people have done exactly what they're told, and then it's overturned because we're told this is in the national interest. It's in the interest of some people nationally, but it is certainly not in the interest of communities who are seeking to oppose this. So there are there are a set of um, well, there is an ongoing debate. What the government has sought to do essentially is is to encourage communities through. Um, various forms of investment, investment in inverted commas, to channel some of the, the proceeds of, of fracking operations or the potential proceeds of fracking operations to the local level. So the way in which local authorities will get to keep the rates that will be associated with this. As by a, the moth. Is, is, and when we're talking here about um, local authorities hit by years of austerity, the, this, these are you know, quite powerful, mm. um, quite tempting offers. What, yeah. What Theresa May has also suggested is that we have a, and this was originally by uh, George Osborne as Chancellor, a shale wealth fund where not only would some of the proceeds of the fracking when it actually comes online would go into local authorities, but Theresa May's idea is it would go literally into the pockets of people who live in the local area. Now, that's about, from a government point of view, about you know, sharing the proceeds. For critics, it's about it's blatantly bribing communities to accept, you know, to accept this process. So... Mm -hmm. We have a continuing discussion at a local and I would say growing at a national level about fracking and that's for a set of environmental reasons but it also raises serious questions about the nature of democracy mm. and the way in which you know, individual communities have the capacity to engage with and dissent from government decisions. So it seems that nobody wants this fracking to take place, but the Tories are pushing it and pushing it and pushing it, thereby even alienating some of their core constituency, which is landowners. Um, I even read somewhere in your report that um, they banned landowners from legally being able to stop fracking if it goes below 300 metres. Is mm. that in your report? Yeah, I mean, they've, they've, there have been fundamental changes to basic property rights in recent years to facilitate this process and these are you know these are land rights that, that go back for a, a very long time and what they've sought to do is to um, prevent landowners from utilizing their long established property rights to object to fracking when I talked at the beginning about horizontal drilling that goes under their properties you know, the idea of uh, kind of a traditional right to land goes you know down to the center of the earth well this has been this has been limited now to enable the fracking industry to so circumvent local opposition that would take that form and that that's the way that was justified in the, the changes that you know the consultation in terms of changes to the law the way in which fracking has been rolled out is has incited significant opposition in in every place where this has happened so the changes in public opinion are well documented by, you know, uh, I think biannual or twice yearly surveys by the by the government in terms of charting public opinion, and it's not going in the direction they would like. 
But there are some people who want this um, because there's some people, and we're talking, I would suggest, relatively few people stand to make a huge amount of money off this. Um, there are people in communities who have been sold the idea that fracking will bring regeneration, that fracking will bring jobs and it will bring investment. And in certain parts of the country where this is being proposed, that again, those offers are very, very tempting to you know, areas which are um, hit by years of austerity and, 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 and lack of investment. But the idea of, of um, substantive economic regeneration accompanying this industry don't really play out even in the industry's own figures. The idea of a massive increase in jobs would require an expansion of the industry at a scale which potentially, one would argue, we simply don't have the capacity to do in this country in the way it's been done in the States. Mm. So there is widespread opposition to this, and, and as people learn more about it, the, the public opposition is going in, in the wrong direction from the government's point of view. They are isolating, you know, at a local level, certain sections of their own party. You know, we have fracking taking place in um, strongly, at least at the local local level, in strongly Tory communities, um, and there we are seeing the very interesting sociologically alliance of um, groups which previously lived in parallel worlds. So you know the. the these are established social justice and environmental campaigners who are you know, being involved in, in um, interests and in, uh, alliances with um, local councillors and, and people who previously would see themselves very much aligned with the status quo. So I think, I think this movement is going to continue to develop in, in quite, I suppose from a social science point of view, interesting ways, but I think broadly speaking, um, it raises a set of serious questions about the role of police in these communities. You see this up at Preston New Road, as, which has been um, in place since January. The, the legitimacy of the police in the eyes of some of these communities is, is shifting quite radically. So there is a need to continue to keep an eye on this and look at the way in which government policy and police practice at a local level are evolving in the face of this opposition. Mm -hmm. I think there's, there's a lot more to come. And we'll have to continue evolving in that way because nobody wants... I mean, the whole fracking tar sands thing smacks of desperation. Why, given all the trouble that this is causing and given all the damage that it's doing even to themselves, do they keep pursuing this nonsense? Why not just grow and have investment in wind energy or solar energy, for example? Why continue pursuing... Fossil fuels, what? Is I it mean, just short term the, profit? That's or? the million dollar question, right? Or we, we it's got... insane that they're doing this. <laughs> well, it is, is it about, I mean, I think at a broader level, you know, this is about a kind of carbon capitalism that refuses to die. This is about a, a reliance of, of not just a particular government or a particular set of energy policies. This is about a, a broader kind of political economy which is wedded to, you know, fossil fuels. Um, and we see under the, the coalition government the attempt to empower communities to object to renewables and to disempower communities to object to, to fracking. So the idea um, you know, where, where many people in this country I think would assume direction we should be heading and we seem to be going we seem to be going backwards. Fracking brings with it, it the evidence would suggest a, um, a, a drawing back from commitments to renewables. So it's not just that this is go itself going in the wrong direction, that when you place this front and centre in energy policy, it actually takes, takes away from um, where we should be going. I think the, the only potential bit of hope is that the costs of renewables decline and then it, that becomes seen to be more economically viable, even if ideologically it, it's, it's at odds with certain people in the government and, and certain sections of the industry. We have a fossil fuels lobby both in the US and in Europe, is incredibly powerful. And the, the, the fracking companies themselves have a, you know, clearly a vested interest in this. And, and a wider kind of fossil fuels industry sees this as being a way to continue um, the accumulation of capital in the yeah. face of, of face of climate change. And it is very short-termist. Mm -hmm. you know, even the projections for this is that this isn't going to be a long-term solution to energy needs, even if you strip out any kind of environmental concerns and talk purely at the economic level, this simply isn't, isn't long-term viable. But in the short term, this enables people to become very, very wealthy. And I'm not saying that's, that's 
that's the, the sole explanation. But at the heart of it, what we see here is a process of really this is accumulation by dispossession in a way which has accompanied capitalism from its very origins. You know, we see here the process of, of basically exploiting natural resources in the interests of a very, very small group of people. And we seem to have a government which is wedded to that process, that sees as a vision of capitalism which is tied to fossil fuels, but more broadly tied to this process of, of um, accumulation by dispossession. And I think fracking is a reflection of that broader political economy, rather than something which sits simply at the level of, of energy policy. How we object to that, how we resist that, you know, there are lessons to learn from history, but I don't, you know, don't profess in the, in the, um, the research none of us do to have a solution to this. What is necessary is that we continue to engage with communities involved, we continue to listen to them and, and for their views to be reflected um, and, and, and actually part of, a, part of a broader national debate on the direction we're headed. At yeah. the moment that's simply not happening. Is there any signs that uh, if the Labour government gets into power they might ban fracking? Well at the, last, at the last election, um, which seems like a thousand years ago, but relatively recently the last mm. election the Labour Party took a position that they would ban fracking. Now, the extent to which that becomes a reality, if and when they get into power, we'll, we'll, we'll wait to be seen. But we have a commitment from uh, the leader of the opposition, the, the shadow chancellor, and throughout the shadow cabinet, for the most part, how far this runs through the Labour Party, I don't know, to, to take an opposition to fracking. And I, I think in part that might be led by high-minded principles and a you know, uh, respect for the environment, but I think also it's kind of political pragmatism that they can see the, you know, the, the, the shift in public opinion. This is fundamentally unpopular. Mm. You're right to ask the question why the government continues to kind of put their foot down as heavily as they can on the accelerator in this direction. I, I don't, don't necessarily have an answer to that. It'll be interesting to see what happens if we do have a Labour government, because what we see is a kind of real dash for gas. That the industry is being encouraged to roll out at a rapid rate. If we take a, a, a move in England and Wales that we've done in Scotland, then this has to kind of stop. Yeah. It has to be undone, it has to be unwound, and that's going to upset some people, but it might make a lot more people happy. Well, Jackson, thank you very much. Cheers. Cheers. Thanks a lot.